Okay, so uh, welcome to the show, Brian Forster. Uh, Brian, uh, I'm not going to lie. You've lived a pretty fascinating life. If you, anyone studies what you've been up to, um, you're one of the most interesting guys in the room, I think. Uh, and I, I played music for a long time. I was in backstage with a lot of guys, and you'd be the guy that I'd want to be sitting in the corner talking to because um, you've been all over the world. You've seen a lot of cool stuff. You've been on several TV shows, Ancient Aliens, Unsealed. You've been on one of my favorite shows, Coast to Coast Radio. Um, and you spent two years, and this is, this is just a few of the things you spent two years building a sailing canoe, a 62 foot sailing canoe. Uh, you're an artist, explorer, craftsman, researcher, scientist, you name it. Uh, and I love the truth chaser spirit that you have, but right out of the gate, um, I think we could start at your journey when you were young, it says you started carving totem poles when you were 11 and we're a creatures podcast. And on the top of totem poles is the Thunderbird, right? right. And that's a, that's a creature we haven't talked about. Do you have any thoughts on the, these legendary birds or any stories about them? Yeah, I'm not sure if, if, uh, if they actually still exist, but um, it's a very strong tradition in the, especially the west coast of Canada and other, other native tribes. And of course, another character they have is they have a depiction of what we call Sasquatch. Uh, the female is called Sonaqua, and the male is called Bukwus, and that's of the Kwagyul people of the west coast of Canada. And they say, you know, it's been in, in the tradition of those people for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and they say they still do exist. So that's, you know, that's evidence that there really is what you call Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we, we've heard that the book was is actually referred to. We have we got a Native American guy uh, uh, on the show, and he said that they were more the little people. So it's 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 a weird. Uh, it's it's it, they think it's like this a smaller creature. It's different than the Sasquatch, but I don't know. It's 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 pretty. You know, it's a little bit blurry there. Like what what these creatures are. So the the Thunderbird. I've I've read they've had sightings up to 2002, 2005, giant birds that look like humans, and. Wow. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of what our show is all about, some creatures. But you kind of jumped into the Bigfoot thing. Do you have any more thoughts about uh, Sasquatch or Bigfoot? Um, is it related to some of the things you're doing now? Um, uh, not, not really. It's just, um, again, on the west coast, coast of Canada, the Native people depict them uh, usually as the, as the lowest figure on a, on a totem pole. And uh, the Zonaqua represents wealth and abundance. And supposedly... Is has been used up until recent times as a way to scare the children because they, you know, the elders would say, if you go off into the forest by yourself, you'll be grabbed by one of these and you'll never come back. Yeah, yeah, I know. So Brian, I know you grew up in Canada, and and how do you get into carving totem poles? Was that something that that your family was into, or just became kind of a hobby? And do you still do that? And what's the significance of of the level of the animals on the, on the totem pole. Is there something to that? When you say Sasquatch or whatever the native word is for that's on the bottom, Thunderbird is on the top. Is there a significance to that? And how did you even get into doing something like that? Well, as a, a person of European background, uh, growing up on, <clears throat> excuse me, the West coast of Canada, um, you know, the, the history of, of the, of the, uh, colonial people is pretty short, like 150 years. And so I just thought, well, I'm, I'm sure the native people who have lived here for thousands of years know a hell of a lot more about the natural environment than what we do. <laughs> and that's what kind of, that's what kind of drew me drew me into it. And um, so I started getting involved in buying books about the the art forms and um, just saw pictures of bowls and things that I, I would like to own, which are in museums. So I decided to buy some carving tools and try to replicate them. And it became my profession from the age of 25 to about 36, uh, where I carved totem poles and canoes and masks and boxes and bowls and paddles and things like that. So it's, it's not a family thing. My, my father, you know, questioned my sanity when I started to, to do it <laughs> on a serious level because he, he almost insisted that I, I go to university and become a brain surgeon, which didn't work out. But uh, he, he, he grew, grew to understand it after a while, I guess. And so in terms of the position, you know, they, t they talk about the, you know, the top man on the totem pole or whatever. What it is is 
basically the representation of the family lineage. So different animal characters uh, you would inherit from, um, you know, your grandmothers and grandfathers. So the, like the bear figure or the, the wolf or the frog, etc. So I, I don't think the actual position means that much. It's just it's a description of your uh, of the legends and, and stories of nature in your family. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard some really cool stories as you were carving those things, people talking to you about them. Oh, you uh, bet. Any, anything that stands out in those experiences? Any stories you were told that that uh, stuck with you all these years? Well, the best thing is that I, I learned from some very major native carvers. I used to visit uh, the museum in Victoria, B.C. every Saturday to, to watch them carving. And so over the course of time, when I was a kid, I'd, I'd bring some of my carvings to them to have them look at them and give me tips and pointers. And uh, the oldest one uh, carver was Henry Hunt. And so I, I, I brought a wolf mask with me that I made to, uh, to show to him. And he looked at it and he said, now you're giving me ideas. <laughs> so that was kind of that was, that was nice. That was really cool. Yeah, we, uh, man, uh, so... Th- just to give you kind of an idea of where we are on our show. So our last guest had over 700 newspaper articles. He's compiled over 10 years from like 1860 to 1920 about giants being dug up in North America. And it's this weird conspiracy kind of thing. Like there are some accounts that have like 500 skulls and skeletons, eight foot to 10 foot tall in a, in one cave. And then the Smithsonian or museums or, 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 or universities show up and these things go missing. And uh, we kind of want to talk about the physical evidence because he kind of was like, hey, there's evidence that these reports, these things happen. But you're like the guy that has the bones, has the skulls. Are they connected? What we just uh, these these articles to what you're finding and what you've discovered? Well, not really. Um, The skulls and skeletons that I've been looking at, which are literally less than half an hour from where I'm, I'm sitting right now on the coast of Peru. That's where this uh, major ancient cemetery is of five different cultures. Um, The first culture being called the Paracas people. And they they were the ones that had elongated skulls. We have clear evidence that originally they were born with elongated skulls. And uh, then over the course of generations, they would start to mix in with more normal looking native people here on the coast of Peru. Uh, So we've done genetic testing. Um, analysis by between 30 and 40 medical profession, foreign medical professionals have come and looked at them. And there are uh, lots of different um, anomalies with these original skulls that can't be explained uh, by, by medicine. And like none of these medical professionals has been able to um, fully understand them because they didn't study this in medical school. So for example, one thing that's mis- missing is what's called the sagittal suture, which we all have that comes down the, s- the center of our skull here, and that's completely missing. Also, the eye sockets are about 50% larger than normal. The jaw is much bigger than what we have. And um, so we're starting to think that these were not Homo sapiens sapiens, but probably a subspecies that I've called Homo sapiens paracas. And the unfortunate thing about that is that uh, we did do DNA testing, but when we went back to our Peruvian archaeologist in charge of the study to do more, he said, no, you're not allowed to. <laughs> he just cut the whole thing right off. Wow. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. It does feel conspiratorial right away, right? Like, how come this information is... Yeah. I, I, I mean, a lot of the, my friends who, uh, from school and they've gone on to grad school, they kind of think that, you know... They have this sort of view of science that science is it's going to do whatever it takes to get the truth out, that it has this moral superior idea that it that it subscribes to. But it feels like from everything I've read about you and all these people who are around this subject, you can present raw data, actual evidence, and it's not enough. It's like we don't know what that is, but there's not like this huge team of scientists to come down and like jump in, right? It, Is that sort of been your experience? Like you're sort of alone with a lot of this stuff? Oh, yeah, definitely. That's the sad thing about, um, because in order to do a proper study, 
we had to use uh, samples from skulls from an institution or a museum. So we contacted the Ica Regional Museum and got their top archaeologist to get involved because I asked him two questions. I said, number one, are you 100% sure of where this Paracas culture came from? And he said, no. And then I said, can you explain why they had genetically red hair? And he said, no. So I said, okay, well, how about if we do some DNA testing? And he, he cooperated with it. But the process took about three years to get simply the certification from the government to do it. And then we got the results. And <clears throat> only two of the samples turned out to match Native American DNA. And so um, he, he got the, um, all, all of the data and all the information before we did uh, a major announcement in Los Angeles a couple of years ago. So he had it, and then I waited for a month to contact him, and I said, have you written your report? And he said, uh, yeah, I have. And I said, are you going to write a major paper? And he said, no. And uh, basically the problem is that the DNA didn't match what he wanted. He wanted it to be Native American, and it turned out not to be. And that's why I also said that when we went back to him to uh, – to do some more testing, he said, "Nope, you're not. You're, you're not going to do that through me." Wow, wow. So, Why? so Brian, I know I've listened to some of the things that you've you've done and put out there, and one of the things you talk about is the DNA actually traces these these skulls, the skulls that actually are not not wrapped, the ones that genetically are elongated, back to the Black Sea area. And we right. talk about we talk about red hair. What is your theory on how these ended up in Peru? How, how did these how did these people and this people group that are not indigenous to Purdue Purdue or Purdue to uh, Peru <laughs> how how do they end up there how do they end up in Paracas? Well, they had to have migrated obviously by by ocean, <clears throat> and it is theoretically possible. I've, I've studied the um, the winds and currents uh, from the Black Sea all the way to the coast of Peru, and it is feasible that they could have done that like almost four thousand years ago because the only uh, of all the uh, maternal DNA results that we got, the only area that matches that is around the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. So some, uh, you know, some researchers, researchers have said that they were Middle Eastern or European, but it's actually Eurasian. And uh, as well, the largest other um, elongated skulls in the world are found in that location. So it's mm. not only physically do the skulls look very, very similar, if not exactly the same, but the DNA matches as, as well. And why, you know, why it's all being ignored, I don't know. But that's why I do interviews in YouTube, because I have to get the information out. If, if the yeah. academics are not interested, then bypass them. Yeah, it's almost like you have to have a little bit of a manic uh, mindset for this information, right? Like you have to believe, <laughs> you have to try to, you because you, you, you said 90% of your information is free to the public. And right. so you're not in this, a lot of these guys aren't in this to like make money. It's, it's, a, it's a passion. It's something that you probably think about all the time. And you're pushing them forward. You're, tr you're, you're coming against these barriers of people who are afraid of this information. But in, in in the Giants episode that we just did, he said a lot of the, the accounts talk about elongated skulls, flat foreheads, bigger heads, and right. so and I can send you some of those. Um, it's really interesting. But right around the 1930s and 40s, they just stopped being reported, and it feels like there's some relation here between what what was dug up in North America and what you're finding, I don't know, I think there is, but, I don't, but I'm not 100% sure, but I think to give a scope of how many megaliths, uh, megalithic sites are there estimated around the world, and how many have you been to? Maybe we can kind of give a scope of where, what your knowledge is about this, this ancient okay. world. Okay, well, okay, um, <clears throat> there are a lot of megalithic sites around Cusco, Peru, which was the capital of the Inca, so that's in, up in <clears throat> excuse me, the Andes, and then also in Bolivia and Easter Island and Egypt, of course, and Lebanon and um, Greece and where else? Baalbek, Lebanon, 
oh, Petra in Jordan and other locations in Jordan. So it's mainly kind of the, the Middle East area and uh, Peru and Bolivia in general, but also e Easter Island. There's evidence that there were two different cultures living there. You know, the, you get the same story over and over again. Um, you know, the people talk about Easter Island as being a place where the Poly <clears throat> Polynesians arrived about a thousand years ago, but they were incapable of creating the really giant Moai, you know, head figures, which are full bodies. That's clearly evident. I've been there three times. I've, I've been to most of the of the locations um, so far. Uh, there are also megalithic sites in Saudi Arabia, which would be difficult to get to. But it, it's kind of th that general area. Yeah, or those I mean, areas. I mean, they're everywhere. And a lot, I mean, some. From what I've understood, some of the, the temple mounds and the worship mounds, are they the same thing as these megalithic sites, or are they are they connected? Because there's like a lot of burial mounds in North America that seem to be show signs that there might have been some sort of megalithic site even here. Um, but I'm not I'm not sure how much the temple worship mounds and the the actual structures are connected. Are they connected? You mean Temple Mount in in Jerusalem? More like these giant mounds that they build in North America that are supposedly buried with these giant bones, and they they show signs of like an ancient worship a place. Right. Um, I don't I don't think they're considered megalithic sites, but they seem to have show signs and evidence that they could have been something, you know, a thousand years ago or something. Um, yeah. Well, for, from what I've heard, um, with a lot of those uh, sites around Ohio and you know that kind of area, the native people say our ancestors didn't make these. Yeah. So it's another story of people moving into, you know, discovering something that was already there. And just the scale, like uh, Cahokia, you know, is a massive complex and serpent, you know, serpent mound and all of these th things. Um, a lot of them, of course, have been destroyed too over the course of time by farmers and people like that. So um, yeah, they could, could very well be that they're several thousand years older than, um, what standard academic demia uh, says brian I, I have a question on that and this has been fascinating to me i've watched a bunch of your youtube stuff talking about how there is like dynastic egypt uh gobegli tepe and these different places you are actually able to see more advanced technology that predates or more advanced technology bu building techniques that predate what would be the dynastic or what would be the the add-on stuff. So everything that was added on to these sites is actually cruder and, and less technologically advanced than what predates it. And so I know that you talk also about saw marks and tool marks um, that you find on, in some of these sites across the world. Talk about, can you just unwrap for some of our listeners, talk about what predates what we know and and what your thoughts are about what happened before in, in sort of the pre prehistoric um, times with these with these giant structures, you have rocks that look like they're laser cut or cut so so finely and so accurately that they fit together without any mortar. And you have these you have looks like drill holes at pyramids and and things like that. Can you unwrap some of that stuff for us and for our listeners that maybe aren't familiar with with the technological stuff that you talk about that maybe predates our history? Sure. Well, uh, actually, that's um, in the case of Egypt. That's why <clears throat> when we do a, a tour in Egypt, we start in the south. <clears throat> Most tours will do like the Giza Plateau, and, and, and that's like the ultimate experience. And then after that, they'll look at the smaller temples. But we start in the south on purpose <clears throat> because that's where, where most of dynastic Egypt is. And dynastic, we're talking about culture starting about five and a half thousand years ago, you know, the pharaohs, etc. And there you see almost all of the constructions are made of sandstone or, or limestone, which are not very hard, you know, very hard material. So it, it is possible that those structures were done using bronze chisels and things like that. And then we work our way up the Nile. And when you get into the area of Thebes, that's where you have Karnak and, um, and Luxor. And there you see two very distinct styles of construction. You see the, the dynastic work in limestone and sandstone, where you have like columns that are sections put together. Yeah. And then in the same location, you'll have obelisks, which are one piece of granite, which is a very hard stone. 
and these huge seated figures of pharaohs made of one piece of stone that are, you know, like 20 feet tall, made of granite and sometimes quartzite, which are very hard stones that cannot be shaped by bronze chisels. So clearly, we're seeing examples of uh, some culture that had very advanced high technology. The same thing with the construction of the Great Pyramid is 2.3 million multi-ton blocks. There's no way that was done by a bunch of slaves or, um, you know, a anyone like that. They, they had to have been constructed using very advanced technology because recent evidence has shown that a lot of the limestone that makes up the Great Pyramid came from not Giza, but from Cairo. So every one of those blocks had to be cut moved across the Nile and then taken up onto the Giza Plateau, which comp you know complicates it like 10 times more <laughs> than the standard approach. Also granite being brought from Aswan in the south into the king's chamber where you have slabs that weigh up to 50 tons, you know, perfectly fitting together with no mortar. <clears throat> yeah. So that's, that's the difference is that when you look at the dynastic work, you see uh, mortar used in the construction in Peru, when you look at the Inca work, you, you see mortar used in the construction. But in the pre-Inca stuff, the stones fit perfectly together. And in a lot of cases, every stone is a different shape and size, which is not a logical way of building something. But it, it shows very advanced thought, very advanced capability. And you know what's funny is because you've worked with your hands a lot in your life, so you understand how to build things. And I've remodeled three houses myself, so I understand. I mean, it took like four or five dudes just to lift a countertop into my kitchen. So we're talking, you know, if you don't have some real world experience working with your hands, this stuff doesn't sound too crazy, but it is. I mean, these things are, uh, I mean, there was that one block, I think it's in Lebanon, that's, uh, it looks like the size of a, two semi trucks. And it's, I think it's what, like the, the biggest block that they have in a megalithic site? Is that in Lebanon, I think? Yeah, that's Baalbek. There's, it's it's uh, erroneously called the Stone of the Pregnant Woman. It's actually a bad translation from French. What it should be is the Foundation Stone. And it weighs 1,200 tons. And recently, <laughs> right, right, right next to it, they discovered another one that they uncovered that's 1,600 tons. Wow. Unbelievable. In in the quarry and the actual site where they were to be moved to is about a mile away. And of course, there are theories that they, uh, you know, they created giant wheels that they put at either end of these big blocks to roll them the mile to get, the, you know, just stupid ideas. So, why they can't. Go ahead. Sorry. Why, why, why they can't simply state that they don't know how this was done. You know, that would be the proper and logical answer, you know. How much do you think how much do you think giants like because because like, for instance, in the news articles, the biggest one that we had in the news articles was 18 foot tall and it was discovered in Franklin, Tennessee, 60 feet down in this cavern. And these guys pulled it out. They had a bunch of scientists look at it. And this was like from 1870. So if if we have I mean, that's that's a that's not that's not proof that those things existed. But if we have some evidence that maybe these things walked around, what if you had 30 foot tall giants? Do you think they could build this stuff if they existed? Well, they still would have had to have had very, very advanced technology. It doesn't doesn't really matter the size of the of the person or the size of the being, because we see the machine marks like at, at Petra in Jordan, which is a massive site. Most people think about uh, what's called the the treasury from the Indiana Jones film, but Petra is seven miles long. And it has chamber after chamber. Some some of the chambers that were carved wow. out of the bedrock were uh, 300,000 cubic feet. <laughs> so Dang. Seven Brian, miles. how are you going to do that with chisels? <laughs> Brian, so talk to me then about, we were talking about machine marks and, and tool marks that would be mo like mod or modern or advanced technology tools. Where are the best examples that you've come across or you believe to exist on, on the planet? Where, where are the most obvious or most overt examples in your mind that where we we're seeing machine marks and tool marks that of advanced technology that predates the following construction? Well, I, actually, I would say Petra in Jordan is the best example um, because you see <clears throat> you see machine marks all over the place. In general, they're it's almost like some kind of raking. A system that was like clawing away at the stone, and there are three like there's a roughing tool, 
a middle tool, and then a very fine finishing tool. And you see that literally everywhere. Um, and you have to be there to see, like you have to be there to see it. You can't look at a picture and go, oh, those are the tool marks. But I've been to Petra twice, and it's it's just it's in your face. It almost looks like these things are melted into place. Like the blocks are so perfect, it looks like, you know, you were if you're a kid building like with Legos and you're literally putting together. I mean, if you could take granite Legos and that's how tight they fit together, you literally can't. Do you think they're melted into place? Some sort of high heat, some some intense rays? I don't know. Um, some sort of some sort of uh, power source they could tap into, maybe spiritually tap into to melt this stuff or lift this stuff. Well, yeah, that's uh, the best examples of that is around or are around Cusco in Peru, and um, that's where you find the megalithic walls walls where every stone is a different shape and size, uh, different numbers of facets on them, and you can't fit a human hair in the join. So the latest theory is that whoever was able to do this work, they had the capability of extracting the stone from the original quarry, probably floating it you know, through the air somehow, and then transforming it into a, almost like a marshmallow material and then setting it into place where it would fit in, it would fill in the void where it it uh, was put, and then would sim that would simply lock it in with all the other ones. Yeah. And again, that's a, that's a granite type stone, so there's no way the Inca could have done it. Kind of like they could do glass blowing with granite rocks. You know what I mean? Like they could heat Something them up. Something like that. Yeah. 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 Brian, I've got a question about all this. So, if if we're to assume that the, there was advanced technology before what we consider, you know, prehistoric construction. What's your theory on on what happened? How did that knowledge disappear? Was it a um, cataclysmic event where these people were just simply wiped out and and people started over? Was it? How do you go? I mean, this is something I already talked about. Is it like how do you your argument for it is that you can't go from better construction to worse construction? These people must have found these things pre-existing and built. Um, how do you, but? From a theory standpoint, how do, how do we go? How do people simply forget or or lose the ability to do these advanced techniques um, in, in the ways that we see across across the country or across the, across the world when it comes to these megalithic sites? Well, we we do know there's a series of of massive cataclysms that occurred between thirteen thousand and twelve thousand years ago. That's been proven by science, by geology, and you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, the planet was impacted by something for about a thousand years, uh, including most likely um, plasma ejection from the sun and stuff like that, because we do see sc uh, stone scorching on the western surfaces in places like Egypt and in Pet <clears throat> excuse me in Petra as well. On the on the western side, you see these the blackened marks of where the sandstone was vape, basically the surface was vaporized. So that's that's the actual evidence. And so that would have, um, if it did involve plasma, which, which struck at very, very high temperature, that would vaporize any living life form. This sounds so, like, this sounds to me like Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible. Yeah. Like is, do you believe that happened? And like something like that happened where, because the, the, the giants account, from my understanding, the biblical, account is that these beings were supernatural they were half supernatural being and then half human but they were right the nephilim yeah, yeah the nephilim from genesis 6 i mean they could have been sort of doing these experiments and then that's why that that's why the city is destroyed supernaturally right that's kind of the theories i've heard is that they were trying to concoct some sort of weird technology. They were building stuff they shouldn't have been building. They were making things or creating beings or entities or whatever they were doing. It sounds like a, a Marvel movie, but you have physical evidence, science evidence say, hey, look, some sort of, you know, something supernatural destroyed this place, right? Is that coming yeah. here? Well, yeah, I think it was a, a series of natural forces that, that did this. Uh, the curious thing is that when you drive from uh, Beirut to go to Baalbek, you pass by on on the right hand side is Mount Hermon, which is yeah. a very creepy creepy looking mountain covered in snow, and that you know that's where the Bible says that the the you know these 
the ones from above came, you know, came down and bred yeah. with the daughters of men. And that's and where, in exchange they got technology. And know, that's where or, Jesus does his transfiguration, right? Where he's supposed to go on the mountain and do his his own supernatural event, from what mm -hmm. I've read. How much do you subscribe to the Bible's uh, accounts of of archaeology, history? Uh, have you found that do they confirm things that you found in places you've been, or challenge them? Well, that's the great thing about the Bible is that every day they're making discoveries in and in and around Israel that support the Bible. You know, literally on almost on a daily basis. And one thing that happened was, um, I think about ten years ago. Uh, a series of dump trucks went underneath Temple Mount and came out the back. I think it was something like 300 truckloads or something. Like they took out all this debris um, and then dumped it in, I'm not sure if it was the Hedron Valley, but it was one of the valleys in Jerusalem. Um, and so a, a uh, uh, Israeli archaeologist asked the government if he could sift through these like, basically mountain of material. And so far they've taken out something like 100 and 30,000 artifacts from the biblical period. Wow. Because what they were trying to do is, uh, you know, the, the keepers of Temple Mount at the moment were trying to hide the evidence of any Jewish occupation. <laughs> you know, uh, so right. far 150,000 artifacts. So, wow. yeah, I've, that's, that's why I really wanted to go in, in March. At the end of our um, Egyptian tour, we were supposed to go to Israel for a week week, but of course they closed the borders and everything, because there are megalithic stones in a tunnel underneath Temple Mount. One of them's 600 tons. Wow. Do you think, do you think like there's some sort of supernatural force to keep this information from getting out into the world? Um, Does it I don't feel think like it's a, yeah, no, I wouldn't say a supernatural force. I think there, there are evil people who are trying to hide this information, and that's why it's important to release it. I mean, with the elongated skulls, with the megalithic stuff, you know, I've been able to produce pretty simple, logical um, arguments for the existence of all of this stuff. It doesn't, you know, it's not rocket science when you see a stone that weighs 1,200 tons and, uh, <laughs> you know, and say, well, this couldn't have been done with hand tools. It doesn't matter how many people you have with chisels. It's just, it's an impossible undertaking for the time period that actually academics are insisting you know when all of this happened i've heard a lot of people say when they're trying to push the truth out or uncover these things that they have weird things happen to them like things will get shut down like uh super almost like you know this there's some sort of force against this truth getting out have you had any weird experiences that you can't explain like you're trying to put this stuff out on the table and then a tornado blows through or what you know whatever like have you had any weird pushback? Um, I wouldn't say so much pushback. Uh, certain doors have been closed to me, uh, especially, as I said, in regards to the DNA testing. But uh, the good thing is that um, what that means is that we're not allowed to do testing of, uh, of skulls that are in like a, a, a public or national museum but it doesn't mean that we can't do testing of skulls that are in a private collection because I asked our archeologist at five different occasions, I said, what about if it's in a private collection? He said, well, that's not under our jurisdiction. So that gives me the green light. And the, and the, and the important thing about the megalithic stuff is if somebody opens a door for you, you go through the door. And that was right. the case at a location called the Osirion in, in Egypt, which is this underground complex, you know, megalithic complex. And uh, we've, on previous occasions, we've been allowed down there for maybe like three minutes and then been told to come back out. But the last wow. time I was there in March, um, <clears throat> I asked our Egyptian guide if I could go down. He said, no, but he said, give me a minute. And then he went over and talked to the um, the senior official who was outside, and about two minutes later, that guy took me down the stairs and let me have access to the Assyrian for half an hour by myself. <laughs> well, well, what's down there? Wow. <clears throat> well, it's a it's a rectangular 
a structure built underground out of uh, quartzite, like giant quartzite blocks and granite blocks. And then on the right-hand side, you can go inside of it. And there's a tunnel that's about um, 100 feet long that has a, like a corbelled roof made of huge slabs. And then when you go to the other end, there's another tunnel that goes on for about 350 to 400 feet and goes to a, a locked gate. Unfortunately, the gate wasn't open, but it's it's a huge, it's much bigger than I thought it was. The only way to be able to see it was on that occasion. Um, and it's probably connected to a bunch of other tunnel systems that I've been in in Egypt as well. They talk about a huge system of tunnels going north, south, east, and west under the Giza Plateau, maybe going as far as Karnak, you know, on and on it goes. That's wild. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that, like, I heard so many stories of friends traveling where you have to, like, bribe people, bring cash, do all kinds of weird stuff, because this stuff's not easy to access. People think, oh, we could just go over there and walk in this thing, and it seems really complicated. Like, no, there's lots of jurisdiction, who's in charge. What, do you find that a lot, where you, it's just no access allowed, and you have to finagle ways to get in? Yeah, yeah, you do. Uh, that's why you have to find the person. There's always somebody who has the key to anything. So you just have to find out who that person is. And it depends upon, you know, their personality, how they're feeling that day. Because nothing, you know, when they say something's off limits, that means how much and who. Right, right, right. And if, if you get the right combination of how much and who, then it works. There's an, yeah. a, another site called the Osiris shaft, which is on the Giza plateau that goes 200 feet vertically into the bedrock. And oh. I've had access to that twice so far. It cost $2,400 for two hours, but we had a group with us. So it was about 60 bucks each. And we had access to that for two hours. I was able to film the whole thing. Mm. Uh, and that, that, you know, that had only, has only been open for, I think two years, maybe three years now. So there's the pure evidence of the existence of this. Also recently, the Step Pyramid at Saqqara in Egypt um, was off, you know, you could go walk around the outside of it, on like two sides of it, and that was it. If you kept trying to go farther, somebody would take out their gun and point it, you know, point it at you. Huh. But uh, recently yeah. they opened up, uh, they opened up the underground chambers of that place. So I was able to film that. Uh, that'll be coming up on my um, on my YouTube channel pretty soon. But there's a whole network system underneath the step pyramid um, at Saqqara. Hey, so, Brian, uh, so oh, sorry. So so that's the great thing about Egypt is that they're actually opening up more stuff as time goes on, whereas other countries are trying to sh uh, close things off. Why do you think uh, this is a question just on a more broader? But why do you think there's such a resistance to to outlying evidence that runs counter to the narrative. That seems to be the biggest thing here, right? Is that for whatever reason, you, discovering things, DNA, um, you know, finding out these interesting things about the skulls and, and megaliths is so just suppressed, it seems. And because it just, I don't, I don't understand. Like it, it, you'd think that science would be open to, in a sense what science, to learning and to, and to, to refining the, the narrative. And yet there seems to be so much resistance against the things that you're finding and discovering and doing. And this is something we're kind of seeing across the, the board when, it, even when it comes to the creatures, things we talk about people, people are very, very quick to squash anything that doesn't fit that preferred narrative. And why do you think that is? Well, it's the desperate attempt to pro uh, protect a very limited paradigm. That's the problem is that you know you go to university and your professor tells you this is who did that and this is when they did it but it's easy now to pick all that stuff apart like that's the whole function of of uh, of youtube is for me is is to pick this stuff apart in a very simple logical way like saying this material is harder than the tool that that culture had so right. that tool can't cut that stone yeah yeah <clears throat> And also, the, like the presence, like I said, at, at Petra, and also you see on the Giza Plateau and area, uh, you see obvious like machining marks. And when people say, um, well, maybe that was recent, it's like some of these sites are located a half hour drive from any power outlet. And the efficiency of, of the drills in the case of a site called Abu Sir is that the uh, 
engineers have estimated the, the efficiency of the cutting of those uh, circular holes is 300 times more efficient than what diamond tools can do. Wow. So they'll talk about, again, you know, like a copper tube and then some quartz sand and they're rubbing it back and forth. It's like, no, <laughs> you know, these are spirals going in, penetrating at two to three millimeters per revolution. We don't have that technology. So that, but, you know, one core drill hole shows you the whole story. I, 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 I kind of want to get back to the creature thing because that's mostly what we are. But uh, uh, sure. I want to ask you one question real quick. What's it like? So all the megalithic sites and the things you've seen, what stands out as like, this is your favorite and why? And then we can get back to the skulls. Okay. Well, actually, I guess my favorite site is Puma Punku in Bolivia because it is otherworldly. It's the, the quality of the workmanship is like almost laser flat. Again, academics will say that this was a Bronze Age culture that did, you know, that did this work. And it's like, no, I've been, I think I've been there 55 times now. It's about um, wow. seven miles from Lake Titicaca, just over the border in Bolivia. It's at 13,000 feet above sea level. And it's unique. Whatever culture did that didn't do any other work anywhere else. It doesn't look like the stuff in Peru. doesn't look like the stuff in Egypt or, or anywhere else. So it's it's probably the weirdest place, and nobody who works there knows anything about you know knows anything about it. Never questions anything about the location. The fact that uh, a lot of the stone is magnetic and was moved 55 miles from from a wow. quarry on top of a dormant volcano, you know, and on and that's on crazy. it goes. It is, yeah. That's that I, you know, I don't really have a favorite, but I, I would say that's the weirdest place. I've ever mm. been, and that's why I keep going back because every time it's like a giant book opens up, and I'm allowed to read one more page in the book, and then the book closes again. That's that's how it kind of slowly releases itself to me. Yeah, yeah, and 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 to get back to the creatures, that's that's fascinating. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but sure. uh, I'm sure when you see that stuff, it just makes you scratch your head. And if you're if you're not <sighs> If you're an open-minded person, you have to you have to just say I don't believe the narrative. And it seems like science has this suff suffers from this groupthink problem where it it just can't it can't explore these issues, and then people are afraid to admit that we're not we don't know we don't know what happened we don't know how this stuff was built, and that's frustrating. And with the giants thing, I want to kind of kind of want to get back to that um, and the skulls. I mean, you've shown these skulls to people and what like probably doctors and physicians and scientists, what are they? I mean, you're looking at a skull. that's almost what, 40 percent bigger than a normal human head. And what do they say? What do they do? How do they react? Um, well, in general, the like the oldest ones are, of course, the natural ones, and they look m much different from what we call cranial deformation or, or head binding, because they're so complex in terms of the curvature that there's no way you could bind somebody's head and make it, you know, baby's head and make it form that way. Yeah. Um, and so they are, are, of course, the most mysterious and they're the oldest and no physician that we've ever had who's looked at them in person can explain what they are because they didn't study that in medical school. The lack of the suture, the volume, the shape, <clears throat> the fact that the foramen magnum, which is where your spinal column enters um, the bottom of your skull is an inch back from where it sh should be, you know, that is a genetic characteristic of something. So none of them can explain it. And uh, How many of these skulls do you have access to well, or have in? <clears throat> well, luckily um, I have access to the Senior Juan Navarro Museum, which is about a 20 minute drive from where I'm at. And there are 45 of them in there. Some of them are the old natural shape. Other ones are obviously um, head binding because as over the course of time, these people had to breed with normal humans. And over the course of hundreds of years, the natural human uh, traits would start taking over. That's why at the very end, you simply have the flattening of the forehead and the back of the skull. Whereas uh, in the beginning, you have, you know, again, this very complicated uh, skull shape. Brian, were these normal, the rest of the body, are these, are these normal sized for that time, humans, or 
Or do we not know? Or do we just have the skull? Or do you have the rest of the body to say these are pretty much the same standard size you would, of human being in, in that sense across across the the globe at that at that time period? No, I, I see the the average Native American living in Peru today is about five foot four, five foot five, and these people were five foot ten to six foot two. So they're bigger. So that's people. a relatively larger <laughs> person. It, wow. it, and I had a I had a question for you. One thing I know about humans is we love to mimic. We love to mimic other people. Do we, we go with the flow, right? And so if you have all these big-headed people walking around at a certain point, are they modifying their humans are modifying their babies' heads to look like these other creatures that are walking around that are supposed to be taller, bigger, more superior, more intellectuals? Do you know? Do you see that? Why would you take a baby's head that's human and try to make it look like something else? Yeah, unless, you're, unless you're seeing something else, right? Yeah, definitely. It, it has to be based on something because you wouldn't do something as dangerous as binding a baby's head unless it was important. You know, if you wanted to look different from the, the common folk, you could wear a fancy hat or something. But right. doing something that complicated and where would that knowledge have come from to begin with? So that's the yeah, I mean, that's that's what we find. Also, the Spanish discovered when they first entered Peru and got into Cusco, they noticed that there were people who had elongated heads and had very light uh, colored skin. And when they asked the native people, who, who are these people? Because they have lighter skin than we do and we're European. They said, well, th those are the last of the ancient Viracocha, pe Viracocha people. So there was a bloodline that was maintained is yeah. what the thought process. <laughs> And was right. this a, like when we talk about the the head binding? Is, is this a, like a ruling class kind of elitist thing where it was, it was a sign of of class or a sign of a, a ruling class or is 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 that the theory that that these people with elongated skulls were actually the sort of in charge or the elites? Yeah, they were the the nobility. They were the priestly class and what you would call the king, like the kingly class as well. And that's what most people don't know about the Inca was that the Inca were a royal family. Uh, Inca doesn't describe everybody who lived in, in that part of Peru. It's only the noble family who were the Inca, and they would only um, breed with those outside if there were characteristics that they wanted. Like if, if someone was very attractive, then they could be married into the Inca family in order to enhance the, the beauty or the intellect or the athleticism of future generations they let but, you uh, in luke <laughs> just for my beard abilities probably yeah yeah, yeah. so I, is this why we see like some of those egyptian hieroglyphs of these big pharaohs with giant heads and stuff like that yeah what? that's actually the the funny thing is that's only during the akhenaten time time period okay. so that's eight, 18th dynasty and he had his daughters depicted as having elongated heads and again the artisans would have to have had something to base their, you know, their study on in order to do that very complex portrayal. Yeah, well, so that, that, that makes an interesting question. And so time period wise, what are we talking about for these elongated skulls? Because is there going to be, are you seeing a crossover? Like these people from the Black Sea ended up in Egypt and that's maybe how they figured it out. And these were all kind of, were these time periods in, in concert with each other? as far as we can date this stuff? Well, in terms of head binding, it was most common about 2,000 years ago. So on the coast, you know, parts of Peru, Bolivia, Melanesia, the Congo, Stonehenge, uh, Europe, Eurasia. Uh, the, the Egypt one, though, we still don't know because it was an art artistic portrayal. Uh, Akhenaten's body was never found, even though Zahi Hawassif Supreme Council of Antiquities insisted that he found Akhenaten, just like he he said he found Nefertiti, which he he never did. Mm. They mysteriously disappeared. I think what Akhenaten was was saying, through having his daughters look that way in their portraiture, was this is where our bloodline comes from. We are descended from Osiris, and Osiris was real. He wasn't a, a fictitious being. Because he, Osiris is always depicted as having an elongated head too. Yeah, yeah, and that's wild. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, you grow up in, you know, if you grow up in church or anything, they they, they make it sound like the stuff from the Old Testament was uh, just allegory, mythologically written, 
It didn't actually happen. But we have some weird stuff in the Bible, like the ten plagues and then the Pharaoh's staffs turning to a snake. And, uh, you know, you grow up reading this stuff and you're like, nah, I don't know if that really happened. But, I mean, you look at these megaliths and you're like, maybe they had this supernatural ability to do stuff that we can't do today. And do you think that might be subscribed to these big-headed people, that they had supernatural abilities? It, yeah, it could very well be. It, it, that could have been the, the extra, the reason why they had to have or why they had uh, more cranial volume than, than what we had because they had higher powers. And maybe that's also why on the coast of Peru they were doing brain surgery more than 2,000 years ago. Wow. <clears throat> Not because somebody got banged on the, on the side of the head you know, in, a, in a battle, but that they were trying to trigger this ancient <clears throat> capability to come back. And like I said, on a daily basis, they're making discoveries in in Israel that back up the Bible. You know, it's only recently that they found the city of David, which they've now proven was where King David's palace was. That's you know, amazing. it was a it was a parking lot 15 years ago, and yeah. uh, you know that little country has so much history that is being proven scientifically now. That's you know that's why I really wanted to go. I wanted to go because I wanted to see, you know, walk the path of Jesus. But then when I started to see there, there's megalithic stuff there. It's like, whoa. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's, that's, found... one, that's top on my list, too, actually, is to get down there and and see that and walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And that's, I'm going to have to add the megalith to this, too, because this, this is so unbelievably fascinating to me that these, and like, like Nate was saying, I really think that like a lot of these things, we continually find things that lead credence to to biblical accounts and biblical places and it keeps proving that what were what what was you know written down and recorded is factual um which yeah. i think also plays into exactly what we're talking about with our blurry creatures and and the nephilim and understanding how these things fit into um a, a narrative that is i would say more truthful than the one that we're fed on a daily basis by by the scientific and academic community yeah definitely it seems like there's a war going on in the minds of the minds of people that that you know you have this battle every day to figure out like what 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 you're being told versus what you're seeing mm -hmm. and do you feel like a do you feel like a strong conviction to the truth is it the truth that you're after what is it you're that's that's pushing you forward every day well yeah it's it's uh it's sharing the the obvious evidence that what we've been taught is not the full picture. Uh, you know, the megalithic stuff, the elongated, you know, all of this stuff. It doesn't fit the paradigm. And the good thing, though, is that as these professors, etc., in charge are getting older and, you know, approaching retirement or actually retiring or whatever, there are younger people taking their place that are more open minded and and know about this stuff. Our great um, new guide in Egypt was that way. He would, he would on the tour, he would pull me off to the side and tell me stuff that was just like, just mind boggling because he knows this stuff is true. Mm -hmm. He said that there's a, underneath the step pyramid of Saqqara, there is a megalithic city, not just that there's a chamber, but he said it goes down and down and down and down. There's also an area, um, Near the Osirion, there's a mountain in behind the Osirion uh, where he said, which is, a, of course, completely off limits, but he was allowed access to the com that complex. And he said they got in there, started going underground at 8 o'clock in the morning and came out at 4.30 in the afternoon. It just kept going and going and going. Wow. And there's there's reports that these giants lived underground. I mean, that's 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 in the mythology. That's in our history. What 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 megalithic evidence or archaeological evidence have you found support the giants like big doors or big steps or things that may may that these creatures walk the earth double rows of teeth because the red hair is connected to the giants they all say the red the giants had red hair and six fingers and a bunch of other weird genetic deformities because you're you're in that science you have you see all the genetic defor uh, deformities maybe that these things had because they were kind of human but not um, can you talk a little bit about that. Sure. Well, there are, you know, there are doorways in places like Egypt and in the highlands of Peru that are, are twice as large or twice as tall as they should be if they're 
just for normal looking people. And there's, you know, there's no reason to build something of that scale unless it was used by somebody of that scale. You wouldn't just build it and say, look, it's a big door that we can go through, you know, it makes us feel impressive. So, it, you know, there's a logic to the idea that uh, the sense of sheer scale was for life forms that were much bigger than what we are. Uh, of course, the, the Bible has all the accounts of, um, you know, the stories of David and Goliath and all of the, you know, all the other stories of, of the deal with giants uh, <clears throat> that appeared in, in the times of Noah and then afterwards as well, you know, that they that they lived on. That's something that author L.A. Marzulli has been doing a lot of work on and some some other people. So, um, you know, the, the great thing is that there's so many, so many people now experiencing this stuff in person. That's the function of our tours is for people to be able to be hands-on with this stuff and be able to film and take pictures, to take home to show you know, their friends and family to spread the information even more. So um, getting any pushback from academia is meaning less and less as time goes on because there are more eyes and hands on this stuff. And nobody has ever been able to, um, to tell me that the Inca built the megalithic stuff or that the dynastic Egyptians built the megalithic stuff because when you're there you just go it's night and day you see stuff that we could do with hand tools and stuff you couldn't do with the most advanced machining machinery we have today yeah we talked about this a little yesterday that like Joe Rogan and those kinds of guys are to be able to they can bring an expert on their show and talk to millions of people and we can circumnavigate the university systems and say hey do with this information what you will it's almost like technology yeah. has given information to everybody and the universities can't control it anymore. And it's almost like they're pushing the temple down in a way like, <laughs> you know, like, oh, we're, you know, like they're they're so afraid of this information. It, it seems that, you know, that, that some guy could come down, film a video and it can go on YouTube and millions of people can see this skull. That's, you know, but then they all go, well, it's fake. It's a fake skull. And I think that's what I've heard every single time someone talks about the elongated skulls. They're all fake. And that's one of the last points I really wanted to bring up. It, I mean, you've you've been around these things for a long time. Can you speak to the skeptics that these things are fake? Um, they're not fake. I mean, they have found some mummies in the area of Nazca that look like they were fabricated. Uh, you know, they look alien, but they they look like somebody had had altered or put bones together that shouldn't have been put together. That, that I can say, but there's no way that these, are, that these are fake because I've seen too many of them. And they are on public display in universities and museums in Peru. So uh, they also have 400 mummy bundles in <clears throat> the back rooms of the major museum in Lima that are, are the full elongated skull mummies as well. Wow. Well, there's lots of physical evidence, and every once in a while, since I, you know, I, as I said, I live half an hour from where the uh, graveyard is, where the oldest elongated skulls have been found. There's only one graveyard where you find them, and there's no way that these are fake, and there's no way that um, the oldest ones are simple head binding, because as we've discussed, they're way too complicated. And, uh, you know, we can d we've DNA tested them. They're actually working on the uh, nuclear DNA right now, which is the the mass or the male side, the father side. So hopefully for results from that pretty soon. But we've we've uh, DNA tested more than 20 of these elongated skulls. And right. most of the results are not Native American. So that means migration from somewhere <laughs> <clears throat> long before Columbus even thought about it. The red, you know, the red hair crossing. would give that away. but <laughs> well, that, well, the red hair, too. Yeah, the red hair, too. Some people say, well, you know, black hair over the course of time turns red. It's like, no, it doesn't. It becomes <laughs> brittle and it falls apart. Right. If you have ancient red hair, it means that person had ancient red hair. Yeah. Well, well, red we got to have you back on when we, we get that. The, the new DNA evidence, because I would love to hear about that. And I'd love to just understand, too, the difference in in DNA once you have it sequenced between what, you know, Homo sapiens and then what we what we find with a full set of DNA from one of these elongated, the nuclear DNA from the elongated skull. Because that'll be really interesting to see how how much we share mm -hmm. and, because, and, and how human these, these things are as far as we consider, you know, 
sapiens. Um, so Brian, in wrapping this up, tell us about uh, where you are, what you're doing, where people can find you online, uh, about your tours, about how Nate and I can come on a tour. <laughs> because I want once this world opens up and stops burning, I want I would love to do that. That sounds incredible. But yeah, where can people find you? Um, the things you put up. I know you have a big YouTube channel. You guys do tours. Just fill us in and plug plug your. Uh, you've written, a, I mean, dozens and dozens of books as well. So. Yeah, everything, well, basically everything about me is is at my website, which is www.hiddenincatours.com. Most of the content is free, but that's also where you have access to, you know, links to my 1,500 YouTube videos and uh, 37 books, thousands of photographs, um, articles, you know, blah, blah, blah. Everything about me is is located right there. Um, and of course the tours, there are no tours at present because of this little international, uh, problem we're having, um, <laughs> whose name should not be given. That's, you know, I, I, I basically went in March, I went to Egypt for two weeks and I didn't get back to Peru for another three and a half months. <laughs> so wow. I'm, I'm fine. I'm finally home. You know, I've been here for about a month so far, but, uh, wow. Moving around, you know, I, I can go locally. Like, I, I can go to Nazca, which is about a four-hour drive. But uh, in terms of major movement, just have to, you know, watch day by day as events unravel. I, I think this whole thing is a con job, and I hopefully most people will, over the course of time, figure that out too, that the probability of catching this is almost zero. The chance of dying is almost zero. And so, you know... Hopefully yeah. the world's waking up and hopefully the world so. will start op opening up too. Oh, I hope so as well. Yeah. I'm, the, I'm worried that these, and just a small note, I'm worried that they're going to push this vaccine on everybody and not let us travel without it. And that's one of my big concerns about this. And, and yeah. also joining one of your tours would be that we'd have to be papered um, in order to, to do that. Regardless, anyway, Brian, it's, it's been an absolute pre pleasure having you on. Thank you for joining us all the way from Peru. Um, okay. Yeah. And, we would love love to have you back when you have time and once we get these nuclear studies back to talk more about how this how the elongated skulls fit into fit into the to hist history and to the greater narrative and really in some ways the, this per these people are some of the blurry creatures we talk about because they're on the fringes and very exciting to hear your updates uh, everybody check Brian Forrester out um, out of his website and um, thanks again this is this has been awesome yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate okay. you coming on our show. Like you've you've done a lot of big stuff, and this is really cool that you take some, take an hour of your time. You're a busy man, hard to lock down, but I love that because you're out there doing it, chasing it oh, down. I'm locked down at the moment, but it will, won't be forever. As soon <laughs> yeah. as I can, I'm on my way back out the door. All righty. All right, thank you, Brian. Thank you. Okay, really thank you very it. much. So appreciate you. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you.